or six days. So kind of a little bit more general, the, the material itself. Um, wood. But the, the strength is dependent on, on quite a few things, the species being uh, the major uh, characteristic, but it's also inside of a species it's graded. The species, by the way, are not botanical species. Um, like some of, some of them kind of match up, but, but only by chance, I think. Uh, for instance, uh, southern pine. Botanically, I don't think there is a tree that you'd find in your, your tree key or whatever you look up trees in that's called southern pine. There's uh, jack pine and there's, what, what are the other southern varieties? Short leaf, long leaf, they're different, different pines. But it's a group of, it's a, a category that groups them together. And this is, this is true to uh, Douglas fir larch. Those are two different, there is a Douglas fir and there is a larch, but they have very similar, uh, uh, and, a, and a few others. Uh, the southern pine is a whole raft of about 20 different varieties of, that grow in the south. Um, this one, spruce pine fir. That's a, obviously a grouping of primarily different spruces, pines, and firs. So these refer to, when we say species, uh, they're really uh, categories of species that have similar uh, strength characteristics. Now, inside of uh, uh, the species, they can be graded in different ways uh, according to strength. The most common is visually graded. And this means they, they physically roll by on a conveyor belt. And when I've seen it done, it's a human being that stands there. It's usually the, the more experienced fellow at the mill with the fewest fingers uh, watches them go by. And, and he rates them. And, and this is done by knot holes, the slope of the grain. Uh, I don't know how they do it. They, it's visual. <laughs> different, different uh, visual characteristics that would uh, correlate to the strength. Uh, obviously splits, that kind of thing. So uh, these then are graded uh, select, number one, number two, number three, in decreasing order of, of strength. So a number three would be pretty trashy wood. Number two is the common uh, structural grade. Number one would be uh, a more premium select uh, higher strength. So if you had a, a, uh, a particular uh, application where you were trying to use smaller members, uh, then they'd have to be higher strength. You know, maybe it's a, a heavily loaded wall and you don't want to, they're already 12 inch on center studs and, and you don't want to make it six inches thick so you might use a, a number one to, to increase the strength and be able to uh, keep it at a smaller size. Um, Another type, these two types are uh, mechanically evaluated, or uh, this one machine evaluated. Um, they roll, the pieces roll by on a, on a conveyor belt and are x-rayed, I believe, usually some sort of, of something shot at them, and uh, the de density is measured. So the density correlates to the strength, and, and that way they get a, a, a strength reading. This, this, I guess, is a little more uh, precise than uh, the visual grading in that it's actually measuring some characteristic of the wood uh, qualitatively, uh, quantitatively. Uh, machine stress rated is another way, and this is, they're actually, the members are actually bent. And the way this happens is they're passed through, a, 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 again, a conveyor belt. And there are uh, three rollers, or three or four, that the wood passes through. So you have, um, here, turn the lights on a second. Or turn this other, turn this, turn, let's do it with the board light. Well, never mind. OK, that's good. <laughs> so you've got, you've got a couple of rollers like this, right? This may be exaggerated slightly. And the, the, uh, the piece is. Uh, 
right? Oh, okay, you get the idea. The piece rolls, rolls along and is actually bent by the rollers. And, and the amount of uh, pressure is read there, or, and, and you can tell how much force it's taking it to bend it to a certain curvature. And that then relates to the modulus of elasticity, and that relates to the strength. So th these are, this is probably um, the more accurate, I think, uh, because it's actually physically uh, stressing the wood. The others, um, you know, X-raying it, it correlates to it measuring. It's a measurement of density, uh, but it's not. It, it, if there were a crack in it, it wouldn't detect it. Whereas this is physically. So, so uh, in instances where you're selecting specific pieces of wood, this would be a, a, a good way to do it. And it happens fairly quickly. Uh, for instance, one place where this would be commonly used would be in glue laminated wood. I mean, these pieces, you're going to take the trouble to, to glue them all together. They're specifically picked. You want to make sure you're getting a, uh, a good product. And, and it's going to be rated for strength. In fact, they very carefully usually select uh, stronger pieces for the, the uh, outer lambs. And in the core, it's a little bit weaker because the outer ones are more heavily stressed. So they balance the, the layup uh, with the way the stress distribution goes. So that's a very economical uh, way to produce the, the lumber. Um, and, and you want to make sure you get the right pieces in the right place. So this, that's the sort of thing you might do for that. OK, let's, let's see. Um, I'll tell you what, I, let me, I'll pass around some of these things too for what it's worth. This is, this is an actual piece of machine stress rated um, Douglas fir. I guess it must be this one that I, it's this piece here that I scanned. So you can hold this in your hand and it may not be as interesting as some of the other products, but we'll push that, pass that one around too. You just make sure you get them back there, right? Okay, because I'll forget. Uh, what else can we say about this? Oh, also, you know, these, these are the typical grading stamps and they're, they're often a little bit illegible and have a lot of information that's not very useful. They usually have the grading agency on here uh, because there are a couple different grade rules by which these are, are evaluated and they're usually regional. Uh, Western Wood Products would be out, out west, one would guess. Uh, Southern Pine Inspection Bureau would be down in the south. Uh, I, don't, I can't read what that is. I think that's, I can't read that. I don't know what that is. Um, then the grade is, is usually pretty clear. Number one or number two in this case, or machine stress, machine rated. When they're machine rated, they actually stamp the uh, uh, strength on there. This is uh, 2400 <laughs> FB uh, 2.0 million E. So that's the, those are the, that's the, the flexure, uh, the rated flexural strength and the modulus of elasticity would be stamped on there. Uh, that species of wood is usually on here. This is Douglas fir. This, I guess we assume is southern pine. This is spruce pine fir. And then there are other marks that indicate the, their mill marks and I don't understand mill marks too well. Well, let's see, KD I know is kiln dried, of course. Uh, so that's the, this one's kiln dried. This one's, I think that says KD. Um, machine rated would also be dry. Uh, drying increases the strength and also um, uh, increases the stability of it, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but other things, some of this other stuff is probably mill marks. Like this is probably a one that didn't get on there. This, these number, this stuff here is probably, there are usually some numbers and things that relate to where it was manufactured in case somebody needs to figure that out. Okay. Um, the wood comes in different size categories and that's based on, uh, also relates to how it's used. Um, <clears throat> In, in sawn lumber, you've got basically three, three categories. Boards, 
boards are the thin pieces, uh, like one by something. They're usually not structural. Um, that would be used for uh, finishing millwork kind of stuff. Uh, dimension lumber and timbers are structural. Dimension lumber is the kind that you'd usually uh, see in lightweight construction. Uh, this would be uh, light, light framing, which are the two by fours and four by fours, joists and plank, which are two by um, up to two by 14, I think is the biggest one that's usually made. And uh, used for joists, joists are like this vertically, and planks, I guess, are that kind of application. And decking. Decking refers to a product that's usually a either floor or roof, and it's it's typically tongue and groove. This is a heavy, you know, actually laminated decking. The three three pieces, pretty heavy stock. It's it can also be a little thinner than this, um, but tongue and groove, typically. But there we go. Um, <coughs> Yeah, <clears throat> so let's see if I said this right. Oh, and timbers. Okay, timbers are the, are bigger pieces, and that's um, over a four by four, a four by four by two bys and four bys are dimensioned lumber. So four by fourteen or four by sixteen, if you could find it, I guess a four by something would be the, the largest possible dimensioned lumber. Anything wider than, than, and these are nominal dimensions, so that's really three and a half. Uh, anything wider, like a, a five inch piece, would then be considered uh, a, a timber. So the smallest timber would be a five by five, and then a, you know, five by six, five by, and then six bys, seven, eight, nine, you know, on up to as big as, you're likely to find with a solid piece of wood is really not that big. Maybe a 12 by 12 or something. But they rate they they list them in in catalogs larger, but they'd be pretty hard to come by. Maybe uh, beams and stringers are this kind of application again. They're they're beams. They're more than two inches. Uh, it deeper, <laughs> they're more than two inches out of square. You could say that a, a square member uh, used as a, and it actually it doesn't have to do. This is really the uh, a size designation. Not it's usually used that way as well, but it doesn't necessarily imply that it's a a column. But post and timbers are within two inches of square. So six by six, uh, six by Eight would still be a, a, a post. Six by ten would then be a beam. You follow me? So if it's more than two inches out of square, it be, it's it's a a beam. It, it's more rectangular. If it's square or within two inches of square, uh, you know, one size out from square is what that usually means. Uh, then it's a, a post and timber. The nomenclature used, uh, which way you put the dimensions, this is a 2 by 8, this is an 8 by 2, I guess is also good to kind of realize. All right, oh yeah, and this is another, this is a, a maybe a better depiction of the, the size categories <laughs> with examples. So these are the light framing, structural light framing. Two by twos, two by fours, four by fours. So this would be the kind of stuff you'd build a, you know, a light frame wall or or uh, joists and planks. These are the joist sizes, six, fourteen, tens, for example. Uh, studs are specifically used as as uh, um, uh, like like a stud wall, um, compression pieces, two by fours. Sixes, four by four by sixes. Wow, I didn't realize they went that big. Okay, uh, and decking we mentioned. And these are the posts and timbers and beams and stringers. Okay, <coughs> the sizes um, are the nominal sizes are always referred to, and that 
that's another way to express that as full sawn, although n normally you just say nominal uh, size. Uh, nominal meaning that's what it's named. <laughs> a two by four is nominally by name a two by four, but it's not really a two by four because it's it's been what's actually used is a S4S surface four sides dressed lumber, uh, which would be uh, one and a half by three and a half. That would be this piece. Uh, rough sawn you could you could get if you went to a, a mill and requested it, I suppose, but there's really not. Um, I don't think there's usually, except for appearance, there's probably not much reason to uh, uh, get rough sawn. Rough sawn lumber is usually rough sawn, um, and before it's uh, dried, so that these dimensions might represent e either one of these dimensions. This certainly would be. I think this is the first cut at at the the mill. This might be after yard drying or something, it more or less falls into that size. It, as it dries, it shrinks. And, and because you'd like a very, as close as you can to a consistent product, then after it's completely dried, uh, or at least dried to the level that it's gonna be used at, uh, they'll usually surface it four sides and dress it to uh, a standard uh, dimension, one and a half by three and a half for a for a two by four, like that. So that has more to do with getting it into a consistent size than anything else, um, and flat. Um, let's see, right, I think that's probably, some of the, some of the growth characteristics, um, you're all aware they have, <laughs> trees have rings, right? And the rings represent the, the age of the tree, it goes through a growth cycle. Uh, and, and it's not like this is, a, this is a dark year, this is a light year, funny how they alternate. No, they, they, together they form a year, one's summer, one's winter, uh, is why you get different colors like that. The slow growth uh, is denser, and this would be the winter growth. This is the, the uh, uh, spring or summer growth is faster uh, and, and is then pithier, it's lighter. It's not only lighter color, it's also less dense. So, so if you have, this is another way I guess you can grade wood, um, it relates to the density, is how, uh, what the ratio of the, the light to the dark is. Um, this one looks like more light wood than dark wood. So you could maybe suspect that's a southern tree. Um, northern trees, like up here, they don't have as, as much sapwood. They're actually a, a Douglas, there's a category for northern species, uh, Douglas fir north as opposed to Douglas fir south. As the southern trees are usually a little bit weaker uh, because they have uh, more um, summer growth or the, um, what's that called? Early wood, more early wood and less late wood. Um, <clears throat> In addition to this, you, you, you're probably aware that there's usually a core that's a darker color, the heartwood, and then there's a, the sapwood, which is a, a, a little bit lighter that surrounds it. And the, the growth of the tree, or the nourishment of the tree is primarily transported through the, the sapwood. It's where the sap goes. And the, 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 the heartwood is older wood. I don't know if it's actually dead, but it's not carrying the nutrients at any rate. Uh, there's not really that much strength difference between the two. Once they're dried, uh, they come out pretty close. I guess, I mean, and, and you can see it in, in uh, lumber. Sometimes it'll be, it'll be half sapwood and half heartwood or whatever. I don't think that makes uh, too much difference in the strength from what I know. Um, let's see, yeah, and density, okay, we can, we said that. Uh, then there's also um, defects that affect the strength. Knots are the biggest one. Uh, and, and knot holes in their placement in the wood is, is one of the biggest things that are, uh, are used in visual grading. 
uh, that's a knot is where a branch came out. I guess you, know, you kind of realize that. Um, so trees with lots of branches are going to have lots of knots. Some, some trees, um, pine usually can be pretty knotty because it has, you know, you're, you're familiar with that. They have branches every year they branch so as they go up. And so they'll always have lots of knots in them. Um, but some trees less. Um, tulip poplar is, if you're familiar, th that doesn't grow up here, but in the south, those trees are like shafts. They grow straight up uh, and very few branches until you get toward the crown. Uh, so they um, tend to be uh, pretty knot free wood. That's used a lot in, in furniture making because it doesn't have, have the knots in it so much. So that's a, that's a depends on the species, I suppose. Uh, another defect um, that affects strength uh, checks, shakes, and splits. Uh, a split is like this. It goes all the way through. This is a piece that's probably, usually a split would be um, a result of, of drying or moisture damage. Uh, wood commonly splits on the ends, and the reason it does is because as it dries, it's going to dry out uh, faster toward the end because this is exposed and it allows the moisture to, to get out. So it'll be dry here and, it, and it's shrinking. In here it's not quite as dry so it's a little bigger. So you have, you have these two different sizes and, and it, it tends this pulling out and this being smaller, it splits this. So you get a split in the ends very commonly. Uh, and that can happen, I mean, just from well, it's hard to avoid. Uh, just from yard drying, it would typically uh, split somewhat at the ends. A little bit of splitting is not, I mean, you know, if it's a little split like this, I guess that doesn't, that's only affecting that length that's split. But if it's split three feet into the, the wood, then obviously that's going to degrade the strength of the wood. Um, shakes. Mm, let's see, no, let's say checks. Let's do checks first because I can see a lot of checks in this. I think these are checks, right? Am I getting these right? Yeah, checks are checks are seasoning defects. I, this isn't real easy to see, but these are checks. Sometimes they occur at the the edge of wood, and they actually, if you if you cut through one of these, they look can look like a check on the edge. I think is where the name comes from. But those are those are also seasoning defects. It means it was. If there are a lot of them, it means it probably wasn't properly dried. Uh, but again, they, to a certain extent, they'll occur um, in wood. Shakes are a little bit different. Both of these, both checks and splits, are, are seasoning defects. Shakes are a little bit different because they, they occur naturally in the, in the wood. Well, they're the result of damage to the standing tree. And damage, in turn, it was overstressed. Like you can imagine a tree in the forest, and, a, and an enormous wind comes along, and it, and it, you know, is really whipped around. Well, that doesn't, that that can affect the uh, integrity of the wood. It can split it internally. I mean, come on, you've walked through a forest maybe in a big wind, and you hear you hear the trees making noises. You know, you know they're all around. It could be at night. You know, it could be a little bit spooky. <laughs> <laughs> but these noises result, I mean, okay, some of them are branches that are probably falling on your heads. That's a little different. But, but the, just the, 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 the uh, trunk of the tree being bent beyond really uh, the limits of its uh, integrity splits the wood in this direction. If I'm bending the trunk, the wood can fail in shear longitudinally. Uh, there in the in the woods, and that um, that results in a delamination. And and I don't know that this piece really has it. This that might be one. I don't know, maybe or this might be one. They're a little bit hard to. <laughs> I don't have a very good picture of one. But they're they're delamination between the rings, so that uh, there's actually a a little gap or a split a, a uh, shake <laughs> a shake. 
between the rings. Now, if if you had a lot of that in the wood, that would that would degrade that uh, piece of wood. So wood that came out of an area that had been subjected to a hurricane or something uh, might not I might might be damaged uh, uh, from shakes. I mean, you'd have to you'd have to inspect it and make sure, it, or that would be taken into account in the strength of it. Um, but that's a growth defect. Mm, slope of the grain. I didn't have a picture of this. All right, I had to. Uh, but this, <laughs> this is not too confusing. Uh, in the length that you cut it, like a, like a, a two by four, uh, ideally you'd like to have the grain go in the direction of the member. But it doesn't always, uh, because the tree might have might have had a curve in it or something, and and you get you can get grain that's that's a little bit wavy. Or either either diagonal or you know going up and down around a knot, and that that affects the strength too because it affects the di direction of the the weakest axis, you know, the weak directions between those uh, pieces. It, the worst case scenario, imagine this: oh, what if the grain went like that? I mean, actually turned 90 degrees to uh, the direction of the wood. That would be disaster because that would be the weak direction of the wood right I, the, it would easily pull apart uh, uh, between the grain and that's where you're putting the major stress if you load that in in flexure the primary uh, tensile stress is going to be pulling it apart on the on the bottom of the beam you just rip the thing apart It'd be very weak so that you know, if it turns 45 degrees, okay, that's kind of half not so good. Uh, so um, that that slope of the grain that also comes into visual grading is uh, where that gets taken account. But it it decreases the, the strength a bit. Okay, moisture content is another. Now this is this is interesting. This is a sample. I found this picture. This one actually one that I tested, but. This was a, uh, a specimen cut out of a, uh, a freshly cut tree, so you know not dried. It was, and if you've ever, I mean, you've, some of you certainly have, have worked it, with a chainsaw or something in the woods cutting, cutting firewood or something. If you cut a fresh tree, the thing bleeds. It practically pours out water. Do you realize that? I mean, you cut it down, it falls over, and it, it it's wet. You put your hand on it, it's wet, and it'll. Uh, some trees will literally, you know, drip. You feel, oh, it's crying. <laughs> it. Oh, woodsmen, spare that tree. But uh, uh, it can have as much as per, uh, like 200% water in it, 200% compared to wood, meaning it has twice as much water in it as wood. But you think, wow, that's bizarre. But hey, come on, you got more water in you than that, right? I mean, if we were to... Uh, uh, dry you out, put you in a um, air dryer or something, and <laughs> drive off all the water. You'd shrivel down like a little raisin. You'd be like, <laughs> I guess your bones wouldn't collapse. But you know, you must be, I don't know, seven hundred percent. That'd be interesting to find out. I don't really know, but a lot of you're mostly water, right? Ninety percent water. So however that relates, and that's only ten percent other junk, right? So if that's true. <laughs> so you're, um, yeah, okay, whatever. So, so the fact that wood is, is, is maybe twice as much water as there is wood is, is by volume, it's not too surprising in a sense for an organic stuff. But you, that wood, uh, that water, uh, uh, actually, it's essential for the living tree, but uh, you're not trying to grow it. You're just trying to use it as a structural member, and it actually weakens it um, structurally. Uh, it tends to, well, first off, first off, it's not going to stay in there anyway. Uh, once you cut it down, it starts pouring out the end, right? <laughs> and it evaporates. It's eventually, if you do nothing else, you bring it in the house uh, or in a building and condition it, the, the water is not going to magically stay in there. It's, it's porous. It's going to evaporate off anyway. Um, but the, the way it evaporates off, um, how fast it evaporates off, uh, affects uh, whether it's going to split or get uh, checks in it 
right? So it, you can damage, the wood can be damaged if it's not properly dried. Normally, it, you'd, you'd cut it down and it's got, say, 200% uh, water, okay? Then you take it to the yard and it's, um, mm, I'm not sure what they do here. I know in, in, in Germany they cut it into slabs and they space it and it's yard dried for a couple months or something, a long time. It sits there and, and that fairly slow, they, they, they cut it first, they cut it wet so that it gives it more surface area to dry. So it, if you didn't cut it, it could only dry from the ends basically. And that would be, that would really split the ends. So if you cut it, I think it dries in the yard a little more evenly. Uh, it gets rid of, uh, let's see, there's in the, in the cell walls, between the cells, there's what's called free water. And, and yard drying it uh, gets rid of that free water. But there's bound water that's trapped inside of the cells, in the cell cavities. And that, that does not easily evaporate off in, in the yard. Uh, what's done there, I think it would evaporate off eventually, but it may take years. So what's usually done is to get rid of that bound water um, is you kil kiln dry it. You put it in a kiln and raise the raise the temperature. First, first the kiln primarily is going to dry it slowly um, at a controlled rate so that it doesn't um, so that there aren't large stress differentials and it doesn't split. It also raises it to a high enough temperature uh, that it ruptures the cell walls. And once those cell walls are ruptured, then that bound water can uh, can be more easily pulled off, evaporated, uh, and then you drop below. Uh, let's see if this says here, B below the saturation point. So the, the point where you've got the, the difference between free water and bound water is the saturation point, and that's about 30% moisture. And if you take it, if you kiln dry it, I think you take it down to um, less than 10%. I think it's, oh gosh, I should know that, but I forget it. Uh, mm. I think 12% is considered kiln dry, but it's usually taken lower than that. It's, I think it's like 10%. Um, it eventually, equilibrium uh, content goes as low as 5%, which is, I mean, now you're talking about the humidity in the room. What's the, where is it eventually going to balance in equilibrium with the, the uh, conditioned air around it? And that has to do with your space conditioning. Uh, anyway, uh, in, in, yeah, this is the point I was going to make about the cell walls rupturing. When, when those cell walls rupture, the wood is physically changed. So there's a physical difference between wood that's been kiln dried and wood that's been just air dried. It's not just the water content. You could have air dried wood that eventually got down to the same moisture level as kiln dried, but the kiln dried has had those cells ruptured. And that, that, that means that if, water, if moisture level rises, it quickly s takes on that water uh, and it quickly gives it off when the moist, you know, humidity level, say, uh, falls. And because it can quickly take it on and give it off, it doesn't split. It isn't as likely to split. So this is another advantage of, of it makes the kiln-dried lumber more dimensionally stable and it makes it uh, less likely to split. So it's a little bit better product, but it but it's adds expense to dry it like that, of course. All right, shrinkage. And shrinkage doesn't start until you pass the, the fiber saturation point. So the free water between the cells, or between the fibers, letting that dissipate or leak off or <laughs> evaporate uh, doesn't necessarily shrink it very much. Uh, but as you shrink it then beyond, as you uh, take the water out of the cells, then it physically shrinks, and it shrinks in different directions. It doesn't, it's not, I think wood shrinks more longitudinally. Ooh, maybe I'm wrong about that. At any rate, it shrinks differently um, in different, you know, by across the grain, with the grain, and the length of the grain. Mm, okay, now let's look at a few engineered wood products, and these are the ones I actually brought here that's gone. Most of these you're probably familiar with. Some of them are you are, I guess. Uh, one of the more common ones, uh, glue laminated. Uh, this is um, wood that's been made with a series of, of laminations stacked up and, and glued together. 
Um, these can be very deep. They, they, uh, generally, it's done to get a bigger size than you'd get with, um, than you'd be able to get with a, a, a solid piece of wood. Especially nowadays, I mean, you're not going to be able to, to get solid timbers that are, you know, 30, 40 inches deep. Uh, and even if you could, uh, they'd be very likely to split because of the, the volume of wood uh, and being a solid volume of wood as it, as it had pulled apart, it would find a consistent uh, splitting plane, you know, the, the fibers and split. Whereas this, you see these are deliberately, look, this one goes this way, this one goes this way, this one goes, this, look at that, wasn't that tricky if somebody did that? Uh, that means it, it's, it, it's more dimensionally stable. It's not going to all warp in the same direction. It's, it's, um, there isn't a continuous splitting plane through it in this direction because it crosses these different patterns. Uh, so it's dimensionally more stable. It's less likely to split. You can get it in, in huge sizes. You can also control the, the grade of wood, like I mentioned, that you put into it and actually put high strength wood at the outer uh, uh, laminations in the core use a little less uh, quality wood and that way uh, tailor it to the strength that it needs to be because in the it, for flexure in the center it doesn't need the strength you could they also make specifically uh, layups that are beams versus columns and the columns then would have a more consistent they would not be uh, uh, <coughs> weaker in the center because the column uses the full strength of the wood. It's all in compression. Um, they also have, uh, can have, often have a top and a bottom. And the reason for that is uh, wood is, tends to be weaker in tension than in compression. So you, if you want to have it balanced, you should use the highest strength wood for tension and then the lowest strength wood in the middle toward the neutral axis and a little bit less strength wood uh, or grade, I shouldn't say strength, the same strength but a lower grade wood for the um, uh, top so that you have the same strength compression and tension and a little bit less in the middle. And if you do that, then, then there's a difference between this and this, right? There'd be a top and a bottom. So very often on glue laminated wood, they'll stamp it top. Top is supposed to go up. <laughs> if you're, and this is something that maybe as an architect you'd come across. You walk through a site and it's, you know, it's, they're building your house and you look up and the bottom says top. You've got a problem and you do have a problem. That, that's something that ha would have to be corrected or an engineer would have to look at because that means it's not, somebody designed that beam for a certain strength and it's not got it because it was put in upside down. Uh, the other thing they do is they, you can camber these things. A glue laminated beam, um, you know, ju any, any member under its own dead weight is going to sag a little bit. We haven't talked about deflection yet, but everything's got a deflection, a little bit of deflection. And, and uh, these, these guys can be pretty heavy. Uh, wood's not weightless. And, uh, under its own dead weight, it would have a certain sag. So you can, and, and then, of course, under the dead weight of the, the building, which you can predict, it's going to have even more deflection, not just the dead weight of the beam itself. So you can take that deflection out. You can have it, you know, an, you know as built with zero deflection by putting a pre-camber in it so that the thing has a slight arc upward, right? So that once it's loaded, once it's in place with the, the rest of the building on it, it sags into dead level. And that's it. That's um, commonly done with, with glue laminated members. What else can we say about them? Mm, parallel they, they're, they're, uh, these are the sizes that they typically come in in, uh, oops, where's my thing? In widths here, three, four. These would, this, is a, this is as thin as it gets, I guess. This is a, a three, Nominal three inch, no, maybe this is a four inch, I take it back. Uh, and they can get up to, to 16, usually not much thicker than that because they're made out of a solid piece of wood across. They're usually not laminated this way. Um, they are 
finger jointed or something in this direction, they're not continuous pieces of wood. They can be uh, spliced, finger jointed, which means they can be any length. There's no limit to the length. The only limit to the length is what you could transport up with a, on the highway with a truck, which I guess is, I don't know, 60 feet or something. So you can't get, um, <laughs> and you can also curve them. You know, you've seen that, you're aware of that. So those are, those are advantages of these things. They have a, they are individual pieces then are stress rated and graded. So when you specify these, if you were going uh, design one, you usually, uh, it's not a visual grade, but you specify exactly, you pick one that's, you know, 2,400 PSI, you know, in compression or whatever. Um, this is another one that you've probably seen. Ooh, hey, where is it? Oh, run back in my office and get that. It must be on the floor or on my desk or somewhere. Um, these are, these are um, um, manufactured, what are they called? Prefabricated wood joists, wood eye joists, uh, which are now pretty rapidly replacing uh, solid lumber because they have some structural advantages and they're also right now I think they're a little bit more expensive than solid lumber but they're probably pretty close uh, they are dimensionally more precise than uh, uh, solid lumber um, they're also lighter weight and they can be made again to any length and they do span quite a bit further they can be quite a bit deeper um, let's see and these the specifications of these are usually um, given by the manufacturers in the form of tables Ooh, this is too dark for me to read but they conform to uh, standard sizes and the sizes, oh yeah, here's one. You can pass this around. This is, you look at the, the piece of wood. Am I right? It has OSB in the center that we'll talk about. This could also be plywood, plywood or OSB. And this one has uh, LVL. Look at what, we'll talk about LVL in a second, but it's not just a solid piece of wood. It could be for the top and bottom, but this one, this one doesn't happen to be. Um, anyway, they come in, they come in, um, Standard sizes like 11, 7, 8, 14, 16, 18, 20. Um, and they're deliberately picked to be sizes that don't match uh, dimension lumber, uh, which should be a clue to you. You're not supposed to use these members together with dimension lumber. Like it would be a big mistake to have a couple of these joists and then you ran out and then you just used regular lumber joists next to them. Uh, the reason is, first off, their, their um, shrinkage characteristics are, are quite a bit different. These do not; these are dimensionally much more stable. The dimension lumber, when it shrinks, will get smaller, and this one will still be the same size, which means you'll have a, a bump in your floor. Um, the other difference is they, they're different stiffnesses. This is usually, as an eye section, quite a bit stiffer, less deflection, less bounce than a than a, a solid lumber so that would be you'd feel it I mean that would be a serviceability thing uh, it's mainly to do with the shrinkage though they they don't uh, recommend you using them together because they're going to change dimensions and not not line up after a while um, there's a whole system that actually goes with these and the system the construction system is uh, a little bit different than solid lumber they're there's a what's called a rim board that that uh, uh, caps the end of it and stabilizes them so they don't tip over and they're a little bit different. Um, they can also run to longer lengths. I was going to look in this table here. This is showing like for a 14 inch, whoops, 14 foot, no. Wow, that long? Whew, 42 feet. Man, think of that. This is a, um, uh, just a 14-inch deep member uh, could span 42 feet according to this. That's amazing, don't you think? Uh, but they go up to like 30 inches deep, at least from this manufacturer. 
So they're quite a bit deeper. I mean, 30 inches deep. That's way beyond dimension lumber. Um, and 42 foot span is also way beyond uh, dimension lumber. So they they have a wider range of application than you'd get with a, a solid piece of wood. The downside, hmm, well, need we say, they look ugly. They're not very aesthetic. I don't think I'd put one under my bathtub. I just wouldn't trust it. Because and it's not that this, this is, of course, waterproof glue. But even waterproof glue comes apart eventually. And, and uh, if you get water on it, it's going to get damaged. So in fact, they come to the site wrapped in plastic. And you're not supposed to get them wet. If you get them wet, you've done something wrong. Uh, whereas you know, you've seen dimension lumber. It comes on a truck, and it's raining, and nobody cares. And it sits out in the yard. It doesn't, it's not going to get damaged like this would get damaged. So that's probably, that's probably a drawback. Oh, this is a solid piece. See, here's a solid piece. Anyway, OK. What else can we talk about? Um, structural <coughs> composite lumber. This is at uh, three varieties. I'll pass this one around. Whoa, man. We're about out of time. I, I thought I had loads of time. <gasps> OK, I'll speed up here. You can I'll leave these down here, and you can come down and look at them. But this is a, uh, uh, what is it? Strand, parallel strand lumber is made up of, of little strands like this. There's a big table of it up in the, up there, right? Have you seen that? If you walk in the, the MUP lounge, there's a huge piece of this, which you should go look at. It's kind of pretty. And this is uh, laminated veneer lumber. It's like plywood, but it's not cross-laminated. And oh, what else can I say? This is, this is plywood, which is the oldest engineered product in the US. It's over 100 years old. This is OSB, which is much younger, and is also in layers, interestingly enough. You might not realize it, but OSB is cross-laminated, like this and like this, the chips are. Um, OK, good enough.